Hello everyone this is Akash Chauhan and in today's lecture we will look into you know the basics of escala in detail and uh, what are those basics uh, i have divided this lecture into three parts first i'll discuss the basics of escala then i'll also discuss how to write you know the very first program in escala what are the execution cycle how to compile it how to execute it so we would get the basic knowledge of how to you know uh, how the uh, basic uh, scala program would be executed uh, i'll also discuss about the scala characteristics and you know the functional programming this third point is very important because uh, you can see this everywhere over the you know documents that uh, why scala is functional programming language so we will also look into this aspect why it is called functional programming language so without any further ado let's start the lecture so as usual uh, the other programming languages like uh, you know uh, java or or c++ we have objects we have classes we have methods in this uh, you know scala we have fields we have clauses and you know the traits so these three uh, what to say the uh, uh, facilities and new features are there with this language with the scala so we will explore uh, each of these topics one by one but as of now we we just look into you know these are the things that we will be covering in upcoming lectures as you can see i have also written over here uh, what is the scala and uh, who has created it i have also included some of the you know the content over here the martin odersky has created uh, this language and actually he is called the father of java c it is called high level language why because the developer can understand it they don't need to understand the machine level functionality for the each instruction for each instruction they just need to understand how to write code in scala okay so that's why it is similar to other high level languages like c c++ java with the scala we have a very uh, good feature that we we can create objects in this programming as well and we can not just create objects we can also create functions as well so earlier either we have function oriented languages like uh, sql sql is purely functional language okay you cannot create objects uh, in you know sql but in java and uh, uh, c++ they are object oriented you you are not supposed to orient uh, the function for each class okay you have functions or methods in, inside the class but the uh, what to say the understanding of the the real incident and the event is uh, usually comes from the object uh, of that class okay so function is a part of that class but the orientation is always the object in you know c++ and java so with this language you have this opportunity to use both the functionalities of oops and function functional programming as well okay in functional programming uh, our focus would be to you know put the mathemat mathematics inside a function and whenever this function would be executed a particular result will be returned so the result of the function would always be the same for a particular input that is called the functional programming okay so uh, it is pure object oriented programming language every variable in uh, is an object and every operator is a method so it is similar to c++ and uh, java it is also functional programming so functions also variables so you can pass them into the functions so it is usual that we used to use in you know sql whenever you create a procedure you pass some variables in c as well you pass some variables but in scala it is more generic we will see how uh, you know better programming functional programming language they use the syntax and the generics they use in the scala we will see into that uh even if we are using scala you need to make sure that uh, in the middle somewhere after you know the compilation it would create dot class and if you remember in java as well the compiler would create the dot class file it dot class file actually it is the bytecode okay it is the bytecode file 
which is required to you know uh, to run over the jvm because jvm would expect the byte code okay so uh, i would i am going to discuss a very uh, interesting thing over here but uh, there is another extremely useful functionality of scala is scala also works extremely well with the thousands of java libraries okay because it is built upon byte code okay so you can uh, what to say combine uh, java libraries with scala as well this functionality is there a hybrid kind of a style you can use to use scala as well so that's why it is compatible with other libraries as well here is the basic structure of how the scala program would be executed and compiled so uh, let's say this is the first program okay this is how you write the basic program i'll i'll talk about this structure later on but it is just we are creating a object of hello world okay this is the class and we are creating a def definition means we are creating a function inside this uh, class this is the syntax how to create a object inside a scala program but here we don't need to focus on how to write this program okay we need we need to focus on uh, the phases of uh, you know execution of or the compilation of this program so let's say we have created a file let's say we have uh, created a notepad uh, we have used notepad we have you can simply copy paste it in the notepad save it to some name with dot scala extension and here is the time to compile and execute so whenever you would comply compile this scala program you would use this scala c command and then the name and then this extension it is more similar to if you can remember java c abc dot java so it is most more similar to that okay because it is inspired from that only execution command is also similar to java abc if you remember this is the execution name and with simple java without using cc's for the compilation in java is to execute the object file so it means uh, the compilation unit with this command would create byte code okay would create byte code and that byte code would go to jvm jvm is actually different for each uh, each uh, machine so if you are using windows a separate jvm would be there the linux the separate jvm would be there or over a mac you may have the different jvm it means it doesn't matter if you have different versions of jvm or different machines but all the jvm would expect the byte code okay this is a very interesting thing about java and scala so it doesn't matter this byte code is coming from scala or java jvm wouldn't care about that because jvm would say that okay okay i will only accept byte code and i will execute it so i don't care whether it is coming from scala or java as long as it is byte code i'm happy so it doesn't matter even if you are using jvm on, on different machine all jvm would expect code in byte so this is the execution flow of any scala program so using this command in your computer okay this is scala c or scala you have to add a, a package i would uh, explain the setup in next lecture or next to next lecture okay where i would explain how to set up your system to execute a scala program the very basic scala program this lecture is not dedicated for the setup it is dedicated to understand how the scala program usually executed in the unit like the compilation and the execution so if we talk about jvm if you have any doubt you can comment down below to this video okay uh, i will see your comments after you know uh, whenever you would uh, comment on this video i will see so jvm is actually the java virtual machine uh, both scala and java c we have already discussed and generated uh, generate uh, you know byte code uh, jvm doesn't care how the byte codes was uh, you know produce it is same for all the jvm okay so this is uh, the basic uh, basic structure of uh, you know how the scala program would be executed now uh, let's come to the characteristics so we have done with the basics uh, we have also done with you know the execution flow execution flow of scala 
we will now focus on the Scala characteristics and then we will move on to the functional programming. Why uh, Scala is called functional programming. So let's look at uh, look into this these characteristics. We have already discussed a Scala is object oriented. A Scala is also functional oriented. We have already discussed. So I hope you would remember this uh, by just you know, going through this lecture. A Scala is statically typed. What it means to be uh, aesthetically typed, it means uh, it would use more generic syntax in the programming. So for let's say the integer for float, okay, you would have the same function, same function. So the, the programming syntax is such in a Scala that it would give you more generic way of writing functions. It is up to you if you want to write more generic operations in your program it is useful okay so scala is statically typed it means you would have more generic functions it is bounded type. you know the practical aspect of this this is theoretical so it might be a little difficult to grasp everything over here so we will look into the practical examples in our uh, you know assignments so don't worry about that if you don't get it completely uh, we can also combine two three objects into one and uh, this would be the intersection of objects so in scala this is also possible that you can uh, intersect many object you can combine many object to find a particular result <sighs> scala is extensible i have already discussed that you can create many more libraries written in different languages let's say the java and it is a smooth to a smooth and easy to use with you know other libraries as well Scala runs on JVM. We have already seen Scala can execute Java code. Okay, so with the Scala, it just not uh, because we, it is converted into bytecode, so that is why it is saying so. Uh, this is very important, and we will also do. Uh, uh, we will also to say discuss a very good example about the synchronicity and the concurrency of you know threads. So Scala would provide, uh, you know, the concurrency and thread safety as well. We will see how, but this is, I would say, one of the most important, very important point of Scala, okay? Because uh, in Java, if we don't use the library, then we have to create, you know, the thread safe objects, okay? If you, if you would use, because uh, all those concurrent and synchronized uh, classes, uh, were introduced recently in two, three years in Java. But earlier, you have to create those uh, thread safety by your own. So in Scala, they would provide you good functionality, the variable, the mutability, and unmutability of a variable directly. So you can use thread safety according to your need. Okay, so we will look into all these points one by one uh, with each passing parts or the unit of this course. Okay, so don't worry about that. You just need to understand, uh, go through what we have discussed now. We will look into all these topics one by one in detail. Let's come to this uh, functional, uh, functional programming. Uh, why it is called functional programming? I have already told you what is functional. Functional means uh, like SQL, uh, things are, uh, you know, assume that you have written something, some logic inside the function and the function orientation is the game to, uh, you know build a project but in real life it is not true okay although it is it can be uh, very useful in some scenarios to divide your task and distributed system functional programming can be very useful but in real life things are not functional oriented okay things are more object oriented let's say we have the gehu university okay and in that we have students uh, we have employees uh, we have different tasks, let's say uh, teaching, studying, assign class and assign projects and all. So these are all functionalities. So if you look at this class, it is more realistic. Okay, you have all the variables named, let's say student and staff and employees, and you have different functionalities. So only having functionality is not enough. It can be useful. Okay, but in real life scenario, let's say this is the class. This is representing uh, the, the Hill University, okay? But if you can create many objects of the, this, let's say OBJ1, OBJ2, OBJ3, it means with each object, you can assign these values. It means with this one class, you can represent any university in the world, 
okay so it means the object orientation if we look into the objects of a class it is more realistic than just looking into the functional aspect of a programming language so this is the basic of functional programming and the object programming but why scala is functional programming because it would provide the functionality to create functional oriented uh, task as well you can create function because i have already told you that it is object oriented as well as it is functional oriented okay but what are the use of you know functional oriented having a functional oriented programming language okay so in general terms if i would say if a language is more functional oriented it is thread safe okay but if it is thread safe it can be slow so with this this is inevitable so if we can achieve something that if it is thread safe but it is also fast then it would be great but generally whenever something is thread safe it is slow you will see how so scala would provide you pure, pure how you can create uh, pure functions these two points one point and this immutability these are the main important points of having you know scala is a functional programming language so if you have pure function pure function means Uh, for a particular let's say value three, this function would always return five. So this is it means it is purely functional oriented. This whenever you pass three, it would always return five. It doesn't matter. It means the functionality the functionality return in the function is immutable. You are not supposed to use uh, or change the functionality of a function. If you change so let's say if after one hour if you pass 3 it would return the different value 3 we don't want it we want a pure function oriented language so we want if a functionality is made okay for a particular value only a particular value will be returned by the function so this is called the pure function orientation immutable variables means if you have a sign let's say there is a variable called int i equal to 5 you are not supposed to change this till the program is live okay till the program is working you would always use i as a 5 this is called immu immutability means you cannot change cannot be changed something if it is immutable it means it will not be changed so if this is there then let's say this this thing is there for object 1 okay and you said this is you cannot change it so even if you create many object of that if all the object wouldn't be able to create it it means it is thread safe so having functional programming in scala is more like you would create thread safe content how to do that by creating pure functions which would return always the same value for the same uh, value and it would use immutable values in you know the function so with these two things you can achieve the thread safety you will look how to do that so it uses uh, it's it's general functional programming is a style of emphasizing writing application using pure function immutable pure function it is always return the same value we have already discussed immutability uh, means programming using constant which means the value of the state variable cannot be changed we have discussed over here something if we yeah this is that this immutable objects are more thread safe than mutable objects scala uh, functional language in in the sense that uh, every function is a value okay so scala is a functional language i don't think this is required okay so uh, this thing if you pass something and it would return a value it would not return any function it is called first class citizen function so whenever you encounter this uh, you know name first class citizen function it means for a particular input this function would always return some value same value and some value it would not return anything any uh, you know any other function it would always return something concrete that's why it is called first class citizen so it means this pure function is also you know uh, the first class uh, citizen function why because for a particular input it is returning a particular output value you must focus on this it will always return a value the function is concrete that's why it is called 
first class citizen if it would return some another function it would not be called the first class citizen that's why it is called you know the first class function so in first class citizen function uh, it is assigned to a value that is it uh, assigned to a variable it means whenever the function would return something we can assign that value to a variable uh, passed as an argument to other function it is fine return as a value other function so return as a value from other functions what it means whenever the function would be executed it would always return some values so this is called the first class function you may you may encounter this uh, name uh, in future as well so if i would say you don't need to remember everything what we have discussed just remember that if any language is functional programming to make it thread safe okay you have to use pure functions or you have to use immutable variables okay and if you can do that you can achieve thread safety but definitely it can be slow if you are creating object immutable objects for each uh, session it means you would have definitely you would uh, be having good capacity to handle such objects because you are uh, for every change you have to create a new object you cannot make change in the existing object so in that case you would uh, you would uh, handle all those objects into the container that's why it can be slow but if you can achieve some thread safety with fast processing it would be great and there are many uh, such scenarios to achieve that if you can use parallel processing if we can use distributed system we will look into this into the next lecture but this is all for today how to achieve thread safety in a fastest possible way we will we can use distributed system we can use parallel processing and so many other things so guys this is all for today's uh, video session uh, so thank you so much and uh, have a good day